Hey everyone, welcome to Experiencing MIS Chapter 8. Uh, this time you're going to talk about processes, uh, how organizations use processes, and the information systems that interact with processes in order to make them generate even more value. Uh, for this first video, we are just going to focus a little bit more on processes than we have in the past. All right, so in chapter two, we talked quite a bit about processes. Uh, we were calling them business processes. They're the network of activities that generate value by transforming inputs into outputs. Um, I'm just going to shorten that into the word processes for this chapter. Um, I'm not gonna say business proce processes over and over again. So we'll just call them processes here. We have an example process right here where the customer is trying to actually order something from some sort of online store. So that store is going to receive the customer's order. The customer is one actor. The uh, store in this case is another. This is probably the store's um, sort of actual order processing unit or something. Not that that's necessarily a technical term, but it's some thing that processes the customer order. So the customer places an order. Uh, that part of the business is going to check the inventory. If the inventory is empty, it's going to kick back an out of stock notification to the customer. So the customer knows, hey, I can't order this right now. Maybe check later. If it is in stock, it, they're going to check the customer's credit. If uh, you know the payment details and all that, if that is rejected, that gets kicked back to the customer as well with the error. Hey, we can actually make the order from your credit card or whatever payment method you put in. If the order is in stock, which we can assume given that we're already down in the customer credit zone, which we needed to, the order needed to be in stock for us to get here in the first place. But you know, if the order is in stock and the credit is approved, uh, there might be some special terms that need to be approved right here. This might have to do with things like adding on a warranty or shipping or whatever, uh, any sort of special thing that needs to be done that the customer might need to interact with. So that's going to get sent to the customer. And if it is uh, rejected, then the order is canceled. Or if everything is approved, uh, that gets sent to the customer, the customer approves it. The actual uh, approved order goes on to the order fulfillment process. And that's where that would start interacting with things like the um, warehouse stocking and all that kind of stuff warehouse, shipping, whatever. So this is just a small example of one particular business process. Uh, it's adding value to the business by transforming inputs, the uh, customer's desired order into outputs, which would be either the out of stock no notification, the uh, rejection of the payment method, uh, presenting the special terms, and then like any of those or also the um, actual notification that the order is approved and a transmission of the order to all the pieces of the business that make sure that the customer gets the items that they ordered. So yeah, simple business process right here. Now there tend to be two types of processes. Uh, there's the structured process and the dynamic process. Now the structured process is going to support more of the operational and managerial types of decisions. We talked about that last chapter when we we're talking about making decisions. Um, the operational decisions were more uh, sort of day-to-day, -day, small in scope type of decisions and managerial were a little bit wider in scope, but they weren't like massive in terms of dictating the direction of the whole company. It was more like, how do we do this type of thing? How, what is the best way for us to accomplish this kind of thing? So a structured process will support operational and some managerial decisions. Some of them, not all of them. Uh, they are standardized. Uh, there is usually a standard way of doing these processes, a certain, you know, structure, some steps that you have to follow in order to do these processes, or at least everyone that has a role in a process will have some steps that they are following. And it's all very well defined. 
and very well documented. There's a detailed list of instructions. There's like lots of training, all that kind of stuff where you know exactly what you need to do if you have a part in a structured process. There's very rarely any exceptions to the steps. Um, so like normally you'll have your instructions that are good for just about every case that might come up and you're very rarely going to see something where you don't already have a set of instructions for it or where the set of instructions just don't work for that case. It's going to happen very rarely because these are usually very comprehensive and well thought out. Uh, the process structure changes very slowly. There are times where a st structured process will need to be updated, but it tends to happen extremely slowly uh, because everything is so rigid, so it has to be done with actually quite a bit of care. Structured processes are going to be the type of things that are a lot more rigid in how they have people carry them out. So, for example, um, working at a cash register is going to be a lot more rigid. A customer comes up, you ring up everything, you uh, do whatever work that you have to do in terms of uh, making sure that the payment goes through, whether it's um, taking their cash and giving them change, or whether that is uh, watching them do whatever card that they're trying to swipe, whether that's uh, credit, debit, EBT, whatever, uh, giving them feedback if the whole process, if something in the process goes wrong so that they can try again, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then offering the receipt, giving it to them if they want it, Steps like that are a lot more structured and that kind of thing, even though there is variation in how an individual run of that process will go through, the process itself is very structured because every single possibility with very few exceptions are accounted for. So that would be an example of a structured process right there. Another example of a structured process in the academic side of things might be taking a quiz, something like a multiple choice quiz. Um, if any of you have done Scantron type stuff before where you have one of those pieces of paper and there's all the um, options that you have to bubble in depending on which answer you pick for a particular question. You know, the actual answer that you are bubbling in might change depending on which question is being answered and which actual answer is correct. You know, you might be doing A for one question, C for another question, B for another question, and so on and so forth. But it's a very, very rigid type of process because the whole thing is look at the question, determine the correct answer, bubble in the bubble that is the correct answer. And you can break it down into if A is correct, bubble in A, Otherwise, if B is correct, bubble in B. Otherwise, if C is correct, bubble in C, and so on and so forth. That all is a very structured type of process. Now, the dynamic type of process is a lot less specific. It's a lot less rigid than a structured process. Uh, these are going to support some of the uh, broader and less you know, understood or less solved uh, managerial decisions. And they're also going to support the big strategic decisions that uh, let us know, you know, where an organization as a whole might be going. You know, the less structured managerial decisions and the strategic decisions are going to need dynamic processes in order to actually address and support those types of decisions. So these are going to be a lot less specific because it's a lot harder to nail down a particular set of instructions that you can do in order to uh, support these less structured types of decisions. They're usually going to be informal, so there's gonna be a lot less documentation there will be lots of exceptions and there will be a lot of work 
you know, figuring out what to do when those exceptions arise, and those exceptions will probably arise. Uh, you'll be expecting to see a lot of different exceptions here. And they're very adaptive. They will change structure rapidly in order to meet the current environment that you're in and any sort of exceptions that might come up. And then they'll change over time as the current environment tends to change. Now, I think the authors of the textbook uh, have a pretty good example right here where they're talking about Nordstrom or some other clothing company, right? How do they decide what uh, catalog they're going to have for a particular um, for a particular season or you know holidays or whatever? Like, what are they going to stock as things change and as the current wardrobe, the current stock, uh, starts to fall out of favor? You know, the uh, the spring and summer catalogs are really important for clothing stores because you're coming out of winter, so all these winter clothes that you're stocking in store are going to be too hot. You need to start uh, preparing for warmer weather and, you know, allowing people to prepare for warmer weather by buying your clothes. So you need to figure out what type of clothes you're going to start stocking as you're getting ready to put all of the current stock on sale and stuff like that, right? Um, so they have to do a lot of research because there's a lot of factors that would go into customers deciding what clothes they want to buy as the change in seasons comes around. So they, they need to look at, you know, what does the economy currently look like because uh, high priced clothing items would probably not be the best in a, a in a pretty bad economy where a lot of people don't have a lot of extra spending money uh, they have to look at what people like to wear currently they have to look at what influencers social media influencers and celebrities are trying to wear uh, they're going to look at fashion shows to see what people are coming up with and whether or not they should try to order from some of these designers and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of possible different sources that they could look at and all try to take into consideration when they're making their decision. And I think where a lot of the dynamic aspect of this process comes in is that it's not that easy to just look at everything and then make a decision because you have to try to figure out how important each different source of information is and when you're able to figure out okay well there's this huge trend on social media right now but in terms of one particular fashion, but this uh, trend has been going for a long time and it's starting to peter out. We might need to start looking more towards the future. Or instead, you know, there's this new thing that's up and coming, like a, a bunch of social media influencers and celebrities have started wearing this one particular trend and we can see a few other people starting to pick up on this as well. And we can anticipate with a certain degree of certainty that a lot more people are going to want to dress like this, so we should start stocking things that look more like this, right? Uh, these are all considerations where you can't put some kind of series of steps to get an exact answer. There's no mathematical equa equation, no algorithmic process that will give you an exact answer to what clothes should we put on our shelves or racks, or whatever the proper term for a clothing store is. But there's no one way to do it. And things might change quite a bit. I mean, social media did not used to be the huge influencing factor that it is today, right? So at some point, these clothing companies had to recognize, oh, social media is a really great way for us to possibly gather information about uh, clothing trends and all that kind of stuff, and they had to adapt and change the structure of their dynamic processes in order to figure out 
what clothes to actually get. So rather than maybe just focusing on celebrities and fashion shows and stuff like that, maybe they also started focusing on um, social media influencers, the people on social media who were getting more and more popular. And of course, this might even change depending on different demographics for the store. So for example, the kids section might have a lot more emphasis placed on looks inspired by social media stars uh, who they might also end up trying to use in their advertising or something like that. Uh, versus the adults sections might have, I guess with the way um, society is going and the people who are growing up and becoming adults and still following social media influencers quite a bit, uh, they'll probably have a good mix between uh, the more traditional idea of a celebrity and a social media influencer uh, in terms of that inspiration and advertising and whatnot. But that's just one example of how complex this type of problem can be, which is why you need something more dynamic. That's why you can't have just a set of steps to decide this problem. You need to be able to be flexible, but you need uh, some sort of idea of what you're doing in order to actually um, make these kinds of decisions. So the dynamic process does just that. It gives us information about how we can solve this problem while not making it so rigid that when these exceptions do arise when things change and when our entire world is upended uh, culturally uh, they're not so rigid that we have to throw them out completely because if these were structured processes that we were trying to use for this type of problem we would have to be constantly throwing them out and constantly retraining people and it would be a nightmare so that's where dynamic processes come in now, for the rest of this chapter, we are going to focus on structured processes above dynamic. Uh, we will be talking about structured processes, and when I say the word process from here on out, you can probably assume that I'm talking about a structured process unless I am specifically saying a dynamic process. If I just say process from here on out, we'll talk about structured processes. Now, we did talk about a some dynamic processes when we were talking specifically about collaboration. Collaboration is a dynamic process in its own sense. It's a way of, it's a dy dynamic process uh, designed to help us solve problems and make decisions and all that kind of stuff that we discussed last chapter. And next week we'll be talking about another type of dynamic process involving social media. I say next week, I should say next chapter, but yeah, the social media type of stuff we'll be talking about is a dynamic process there. But we're focusing on structured processes for this chapter. Now, a process will have three different types of scopes, which I'll talk about in a little more detail. A workgroup scope, an enterprise scope, and an inter-enterprise scope. Say that three times fast. So a workgroup process uh, facilitates a work group in fulfilling their purpose and goals. And when I talk about a work group, I'm talking about a relatively small group of people that are all doing work under one sort of banner. They're doing one type of work, one flavor of work, you could say. Um, at Alan Hancock, we have several what you might consider work groups. Uh, you could consider some of the academic affairs uh, employees a work group. Uh, IT might be a work group. Facilities might be a work group. Um, and so on and so forth. They, everyone in the IT department is doing IT stuff. Everyone in academic affairs is doing academic affairs. Everyone in financial aid is doing financial aid related work and so on and so forth. And that work group is going to have some purpose, some goal that they're trying to accomplish. With financial aid, it would be trying to give monetary support to students or make sure they have 
monetary support if it's not something that Alan Hancock is directly giving. Uh, support in the sense of like uh, money that they are able to use to pay for college in the immediate sense. So loans or scholarships, things like that. But that could be an example of a work group within the college. You might even be able to consider teachers as being in a work group based on the department or even sub-department sort of that they are working in. Um, for example, all the teachers in the math department could be considered a work group. All the teachers who are teaching uh, CBiz classes, like me, uh, we all could be considered a work group. Or you might also be able to make the argument that the uh, business department as a whole would count all the teachers in that department would count as a work group, though we don't work super closely with each other um, unless we really need to. I work a lot closer with the other teachers who are teaching things like CBiz and CBot classes, but you could talk about all of that kind of stuff, teachers within particular departments as being work groups within the college. Now, a work group information system would support one or more processes within a work group, and we'll also sometimes call them functional information systems with the applications, uh, the, the sort of software component of a work group information system, sometimes being called a functional application or something like that. Now, there's going to be tens of users, maybe hundreds at the absolute largest size of things, because work groups tend to be pretty small. Uh, it's going to be difficult to change these types of information systems because um, they're, they're a lot more structured and people rely on them quite a bit more. So if things do end up getting changed, it's going to cause some pretty major ripples because they might be pretty tightly integrated into the work group that they are a part of. Um, for example, uh, you might consider my lab IT to be a component of the uh, CBiz teachers work group because quite a few of us use my lab IT for various classes and we're all pretty familiar with how to use it. Um, we don't have to struggle getting used to the system because we're typically trained by someone else in order to use the system. And when we get started with my lab IT for the first time, uh, typically we are able to start using it with maybe a few hiccups at the very beginning. But from then on, once we have it down, once we actually have the system that we're using, we're able to continue using that system very easily. Uh, I can very easily make changes to the my lab IT curriculum if that ever needs to happen for future iterations of CBiz 101. And then I can um, very easily just copy it into a new section and that new section will have the exact same curriculum as before so long as I don't need to make any changes in between then. So it becomes uh, very ingrained within the departmental work group. Problems can also be resolved within the work group. If a single professor is having a lot of trouble with, let's say, my lab IT, uh, they're usually able to talk to other people in the work group in order to uh, actually, you know, get that problem solved or get help in solving that problem. Uh, so that is how you could potentially, potentially look at it as a workgroup information system, or at least a component of the workgroup information system in the CBiz workgroup. Uh, in reality, it would probably be an inter-enterprise type of uh, software, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So right here, I have a few... Um, examples of worker processes for an example business. This business has various different work groups like sales and marketing, operations, manufacturing, customer service, and so on and so forth. 
And there are some example processes that are involved with the actual workgroup processes that facilitate the goals of that workgroup. Um, I'll just go through sales and marketing right now. Uh, lead generation right here, the process of actually reaching out and trying to make new customers. Uh, lead tracking, which is, you know, if you have some initial communication, let's say, or if you've identified potential customers, uh, following up with them, you know, making sure that these potential customers are still interested and still engaged with the work, and they might still be future customers and so on and so forth. Uh, actually managing the customers, uh, forecasting your sales, and managing the product and brand are all very important aspects of the sales and marketing side of a business. Now, uh, as a quote unquote fun, if you, I guess fun if you are really uh, into sales and marketing type of stuff, or even in, into uh, any of these types of processes right here, if any of these kind of look interesting to you, it might be useful to think of what a is what the actual process might look like for some of these different um, processes. You know, maybe even draw out the, the process diagram if you remember how to do that from chapter two. It might be a good non-mandatory exercise if you are feeling up to it. It's not mandatory, of course. Uh, I will give you a brief second to pause if you want to look through any of the other type of work groups right here and see, you know, maybe how those help that work group accomplish their goals and fulfill their purpose, their reason for existing within the company. So I'll give you a second to pause and then we'll come back after. Now, an enterprise process, uh, these types of processes are going to span an organization. They're going to support activities within multiple departments. So these processes um, are going to be ones that, uh, that involve a lot of people throughout a particular organization that are all playing very, very different roles. Uh, so rather than being hyper specific towards the role that one particular, uh, you know, one particular department or work group or whatever is playing, uh, these are going to be very helpful for a lot of people and a lot of different, very different work groups. Now, I would consider the process of registration to be an enterprise process, the process of all the students registering for their classes. Um, and I'm going to take a look at Alan Hancock as an organization where the members of the organization are people specifically working for Alan Hancock, uh, being paid by Alan Hancock to provide some sort of value. So this definition would not consider students to be part of the organization. There wouldn't really be a student department or work group or anything like that. But I want to talk about registration in terms of how it affects the Allen Hancock employees. So, of course, uh, there's going to be financial aid involved in this whole thing where uh, financial aid will provide payments to students or you know, facilitate students with the money that they need in order to actually do the registration. Um, there will be things like uh, academic affairs, uh, checking to make sure that students are in good standing and are actually able to register. Um, there's all the processes that uh, work on things like different registration timing or priorities or things like that that uh, determine when a student is actually able to register. So that might uh, involve a whole lot of different organizations within, or a whole lot of different uh, groups within Allen Hancock. Uh, DEI for sure would be involved in any sort of registration priority, anything that allows uh, students who need priority registration to accommodate um, something with their 
health or the physical or mental health, um, they would be involved in the registration in that way. So the process of registration touches D the DEI uh, workgroup. It also uh, has to do with uh, academic affairs in the sense of, um, you know, make in, in the sense of scheduling teachers in order to actually make sure that classes are available. So once teachers are scheduled, those classes can actually be put up on the uh, registration schedule so that students are able to register for them. And that uh, fundamentally affects teachers as well. So all the teachers are participating in that by giving their schedules, giving their availabilities, giving the classes that they are able to teach, all that kind of stuff. Um, the teachers are very involved in the registration process itself. So, uh, oh, and I, I believe uh, facilities would also be involved if I'm thinking about their role in all this correctly. I believe they would be involved in terms of figuring out the room arrangements for different classrooms. So with all of that, you could consider uh, registration to be an enterprise process within Allen Hancock because it's a process that supports a lot of activities in a lot of different departments or work groups or whatever within the organization. Now, an enterprise information system would support one or more enterprise processes. So this would have hundreds or even thousands of users, depending on the size of the organization and the size of the process. Uh, there are formalized procedures and these are extensively documented. They would require training in order to use them. And problems with these procedures may involve multiple work groups or departments. So, for example, if we think about registration, uh, we can think about the actual registration software that allows all of you to register for your classes. So there are a lot of different users there. Uh, the procedures for all of you using the software are very, you know, I, ideally they would be extensively documented. I don't know whether this is true or not, but ideally there would be a lot of instructions for how you all are able to register. Um, one would hope. Uh, and uh, any of the problems that happen with this registration software, especially if it happens during registration, this would involve multiple work groups or departments. So like IT would be involved, academic affairs would be involved, financial aid would probably be involved, uh, DEI might be involved if it's something like um, the server goes down and nobody's able to use the registration software and things like priority enrollment are missed and all that kind of stuff. So there'd be a lot of people working to fix the system, to communicate with students, to fix the registration actual days, uh, the days in which students register, and so on and so forth. So that software could be part of an enterprise information system. It's uh, getting in data regarding what classes everybody wants to take, the schedules of classes, uh, the availability, especially as time goes on and more and more students register, and so on and so forth. So that would be uh, possibly one example of an enterprise process. A much simpler example might be a timesheet program, a program where you put in hours that you have worked and submit that to you know, accounting or wherever that would actually go. Uh, that would touch a lot of different departments because a lot of people would be using that in order to fill out their hours. And then it would touch accounting, of course, because they're the ones who actually do the payment. It might touch other departments like 
uh, possibly HR would be the ones to handle this uh, to determine like, hey, if someone is working more hours than we're legally allowed to make them work, uh, do we need to contact them or f like figure out what's going on? Like all that kind of stuff. Like, do we, do we need to have a talk with them or their manager or both? So all of that kind of stuff, that could be another example of an enterprise information system. Now, with both of these enterprise information systems, it's very possible that, again, these aren't enterprise, these end up being inter-enterprise. And this, that's another thing where I'll have to uh, come back to that idea when we talk about inter-enterprise um, information systems. But there might be components of these information systems that are themselves uh, inter-enterprise. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about it now uh, because we're talking about inter-enterprise processes. So these span two or more independent organizations. Uh, inter-enterprise information systems support one or more of these inter-enterprise processes. They're going to have thousands of users at the very least, and any problems within them might involve cooperation among independently or owned organizations. And we'll talk more about some ideas, some examples of inter-enterprise processes, but uh, it's worth mentioning that there are some softwares that are used within the different levels of processes that might be used among a lot of other organizations. So for example, I talked about MyLab IT, uh, but MyLab IT isn't just an Alan Hancock kind of thing. It's used by Alan Hancock as well as a number of other schools. And if there are problems in general with MyLab IT, um, it might not just be a thing where Alan Hancock itself can resolve this, but it might have to reach out to Pearson in order to resolve, help resolve issues. Uh, so Alan Hancock and Pearson together might need to work to resolve issues within my lab IT. And even if things get really bad, Pearson might be talking to multiple different colleges, helping resolve issues. So this does kind of blur the line a little bit, I would say, um, because Alan Hancock has its own work group processes that might take advantage of MyLab IT or other software might take advantage of Microsoft Office 365. Uh, we might have worker processes that take advantage of things made by other companies that are being used by other organizations, but that software that is being used by a lot of different organizations is uh, supporting a work group process, a process that people in Allen Hancock made to serve their work group's needs. It's not like uh, we are on this massive conference call with a whole bunch of schools that all use MyLab IT and we're all talking about like, how do we best do this? How do we do all this kind of stuff? How do we resolve these problems? All that kind of stuff. We mostly focus within ourselves and if necessary, maybe contact Pearson about things, but most of the time it's going to just be within our own work group. So that could be considered a work group information system, even though it is used by a lot of other colleges. Similar thing with the registration software. We, um, I don't believe Alan Hancock actually makes their own registration software. Um, it was a big thing for schools to write their own programs. The idea being that 
it would be more secure, it would be cheaper to make their own than to pay someone for it. A lot of schools used to do that, but then slowly and yet surely started moving towards uh, getting software that other people made. But they still have their own processes regarding registration, their own enterprise processes regarding registration. Everything is, uh, everything sort of plays out in this, uh, everything plays out the way that they set up their enterprise processes to be. So even though it's software that is being used by a lot of different people, a lot of different organizations, it's still an enterprise process because the process itself was made by that organization, in our case, by Alan Hancock. It was made by Alan Hancock with Alan Hancock specific details and Alan Hancock specific steps. And um, it just happens to use this software. So that would still be an enterprise information system. So when we get to inter-enterprise inter processes, that's the kind of thing that will span across multiple organizations rather than just being something that another company happened to make that is being used within an organization or within a work group. So for Alan Hancock, an example of an inter-enterprise process might be the process of students getting their textbooks from the bookstore because the Alan Hancock bookstore isn't actually owned by Alan Hancock. It's owned by, I believe it's eFollet or something like that. But it's owned by a company that is actually in the business of um, running bookstores for colleges. So this external company is the company that you're going through when you're actually seeing what textbooks you need to have for a particular class. And it's the company that you're buying those textbooks through. So that could be an inter-enterprise process. And the uh, information systems that support that would be things like the bookstore's website, specifically the um, Alan Hancock bookstore webpage, which isn't actually a, a webpage on the Alan Hancock website, but it's a webpage uh, on another, another site entirely, uh, that website itself would be a, a large part of the uh, information system because that's the uh, part of the software that is helping to obtain and process uh, student orders. Um, it also would, you also would have the uh, inventory databases that would interact with the Allen Hancock bookstore, as well as probably other um, bookstores owned by the same parent company. All of that would be part of this inter-enterprise uh, system, information system. So that could be an example of an inter-enterprise information system that supports the process of helping Alan Hancock students obtain their books. The actors in this case would include uh, the students themselves, the, um, the actual uh, physical, you know, Alan Hancock in terms of like the physical location that it's providing for the bookstore, the bookstore pairing company itself, uh, and, you know, there would be subdivisions in terms of, like, different departments within these different organizations that are a part of this, all that kind of stuff. But I would consider that to be inter-enterprise because it's directly involving multiple people. Similar thing for when uh, we, as instructors, get in contact with uh, sales reps for companies when we're trying to determine curriculum. So we'll have a lot of interactions between multiple different company or multiple different uh, work groups within a particular uh, company when we're actually chatting with the sales reps 
um, to determine which uh, products we're going to start using in our education. So that'd be another example related to Alan Hancock. All right, well, that's more about processes. We actually went and defined a lot more information about the types of processes and the scopes of processes that we'll be talking about through this entire chapter. And one more reminder that uh, I'm going to be focusing on structured processes in the discussion of this particular chapter. So when I'm talking about processes, I'm talking about structured processes right here. Just remember to keep that in mind as I keep on going through the different videos. Regardless, uh, that's a little more information about processes. So we're going to talk more about the relationship between information systems and processes, uh, how information systems can make processes higher quality. So that's the next video.